Okay, today I'm going to talk about the subject of tech entrepreneurship. So you want to be a tech entrepreneur. Now I know you don't all want to be tech entrepreneurs, but maybe some of you do, and, and I think there will be some things that are at least somewhat interesting to you here. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background. We'll talk about what technology entrepreneurship is, and I'll talk about things that I feel like you need to know and there are some really key principles that I think if you understand these principles, it's very helpful to the rest of the semester here. So, um, back in 1979, my dad brought home this computer, a Heath kit, H89, and we built it from a kit. And building a, how many of you have built a computer today? How many of you have built a computer? And what's that process like? Okay, you screw some screws together, you plug in some wires, you have these components that you plug together. Okay, back in the day, okay, this will be one of those stories where we go uphill in the snow to school. Back in the day, we had hundreds or thousands of little parts, little resistors, little capacitors, little transistors, other things that we would plug into circuit boards and we'd solder them, and there was a lot of assembly involved in this thing. And how many of you have written a software program before? Have you ever had bugs in your programs? How do you deal with bugs in your programs? You run it, you test it, you see what doesn't work, you think about it, you bang your head on it, you go Google some problems and find some things on Stack Overflow, and you fix the little bugs. Well, hardware assembly also has bugs, and we had to test our hardware as well. And sometimes we'd have to unsolder something that we'd soldered together wrong. And anyway, it was a really neat process, and I got hooked on computers. I just, I loved being involved with software. We got this thing working and, and um, instantly I knew that I had to be a programmer. Here's, you know what, the resolution is not great on this. Hang on a second, let me try something. Let me try changing the presentation mode. I'm going to use that as a separate display. Is it just, is it the projector's out of focus? Or, let's see, <coughs> hang on. That isn't any better either. Um, is that better? Okay, so now I just need to get the presentation. Let's see here. Okay, now my mouse is stuck, not going over onto. <laughs> Why does my mouse not work? All right, hold on. We're going to try the. Yeah, cascading bugs. All right. This is a new MacBook Pro, and I think that must be part of the trouble here. One of my students sent me a video of uh, this guy doing. Um, he was mocking the dongle situation. I have this mother of all dongles over here. Uh, anyway, there, uh, it was a really funny video. It was funny because it was true. Um, and it's still the same resolution. Okay. Well, all right, I guess we're stuck with this. Okay. Uh, anyway, this is what the inside of that computer looked like, and it's hard to tell at this resolution, but there were all kinds of little parts and pieces that had to go together. But to a 14-year-old kid who was built to be a nerd, it was just sort of a marriage made in heaven. Um, I went and got a, a bachelor's degree and then a PhD in computer science. And I've done a lot of software development over the years, so for decades now. Um, I've developed software for mainframes, for PCs, for everything in between. I'm, uh, I'm on the information systems faculty, as I explained last week, and I've done a number of things with startups. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. In the last few years, I've been doing a deep dive into mobile development, and so that's where some of my expertise is. Uh, my current phone is an iPhone 6 Plus, this thing on the right here, and so obviously I need to hook myself up with some new technology here sometime soon. Um, okay, now, here's the definition of an entrepreneur. Literally, the word entrepreneur means undertaker. Does anybody speak French here? Isn't that what it means, entrepreneur, undertaker? Sort of? <laughs> between taker. Between taker? Okay. 
All right, well, I'm going to go with my version. <laughs> An entrepreneur literally means undertaker, somebody who undertakes an enterprise. Yeah, entre is between, but anyway. Um, one who owns and manages a business. The person who takes the risk of profit or loss. And that comes from the Oxford English Dictionary, the second part here. Um, an entrepreneur is, is a risk taker, somebody who does something that hasn't been done before necessarily. Um, and technology entrepreneurship then, building on that idea, is the creation, the cultivation, the management of ventures whose core products are based on information technology of some sort. So Facebook is a technology entrepreneurship kind of a play. Um, Instagram, that's tech entrepreneurship. Uber, is that about driving taxis, cars, or is that about technology? It's kind of an interesting blend. Okay, but uh, a technology, the technology entrepreneurship that we're interested in is scalable ventures. Scalable ventures change the world. Scalable ventures let their founders do something with the resources that come to that, that scalable venture. What's the biggest company you can think of? Okay, I'm here in Amazon, I'm here in Apple. Walmart. Okay, these are some pretty big companies. Apple, I think, has the largest market capitalization. Uh, you can go check what their current value is, but the last I heard, they were approaching a trillion dollars. And that's an amazing amount of resources. And they're doing some pretty cool stuff with it. Um, we can argue about whether, so Google is taking a little bit of fire. Some of the tech companies, a lot of the tech companies are taking fire for uh, censorship right now. We can argue about whether they're doing well and working responsibly with all of that resource that they have. But scalable ventures put you in a position to have influence in the world. And that's just natural. That's part of what happens with tech entrepreneurship. Now, I am academic director for the Rollins Center. Why do we have a Rollins Center, a Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology? The reason is because you all live, we all live in a networked and digitized world. And the implications behind this are really profound. At the risk of uh, telling more stories about going uphill in the snow both ways on my way to school, um, you live a very different lifestyle than I did when I was your age. What were my expectations for a telephone compared to your expectations for a telephone? Okay, I expected that I could pick a telephone up off the wall and dial seven digits and talk to somebody. Um, I expected that when the phone rang, I actually had to answer it. And when I answered it, it would, it would probably be for somebody else in the home, but it was something that you did. You actually answered the home phone. You had a home phone hanging on the wall, and you answered it. And when push-button phones came, we thought, man, that's great. Okay, you live in a very different world. Today, you can have internet access while you're doing 70 miles an hour down I-15. Now, hopefully, you're a passenger, not a driver. I really hope that's true when you have that internet access, but um, we live differently today than we did when I was a kid. Has anybody here ever dialed information and asked a question? Okay, a few, a few. That used to be a very common thing. What do you do when you have a question? You Google it. You even have a verb that we didn't even, hadn't even thought of when I was your age. Google. We Google it. Um, now. We want to prepare our students, you all, to enter this world and to really be expert in it. We want you to, to have all the tools that you need. And so the Rollins Center tries to help to build extraordinary entrepreneurs who can do great stuff. We want you to succeed and that's why we exist. We have a lot of resources available for you. Um, let me tell you a little bit more about my road to entrepreneurship and why I feel like I have a good fit at the Rollins Center. Back in high school, my friends and I got together and we developed a little consultancy. We were basically coders for hire, and, and this was back when um, the level of programming we could do was pretty low compared to what we can do today with all the open source software that's out there. In my early college days, I continued with that entrepreneurial bent, and I worked as a software developer for several startups. Um, I spent, I've written a lot of code, hundreds of thousands of lines of software over the years. 
and I really enjoy it too. One of, the, one of my little sayings is, um, little's law, you're never done programming. Um, another thing I like to say is, hey, there are a few things I enjoy more than a good coding frenzy. You know, sharks have feeding frenzies, programmers have coding frenzies. Um, anyway, so that does define me as a nerd, I recognize that, that's okay. I've, I've come to terms with that. Um, girls actually like nerds, it turns out. Um, at least some, some. <laughs> okay, uh, all right. Now, uh, I, I decided I was so into this stuff that I had to go get a PhD in computer science. I knew that to solve the interesting problems that were coming to me, I needed a graduate level of education. And so I interrupted my, well, I didn't really interrupt my entrepreneurial pursuits. I kept working on my startups while I was doing my PhD. And from there, I joined the Marriott School in 1995. Uh, here are some of the companies that I've worked with over the years. Uh, there are a lot more. Now, if you're going to be a tech entrepreneur, I know you need a lot of background. You need these kinds of things. Now, number one, you've got to be able to analyze the opportunities around you and decide, is it just another idea or is it an opportunity worth pursuing? How many of you have an idea for a business that you think this might be a pretty good business? How many of you have an idea? Okay, is it an opportunity worth pursuing? That's the question, right? Or is it just an idea? Um, we have learned over the years that there are some better ways to find out is this an opportunity worth pursuing? There's a, a relatively recent movement in the entrepreneurial world called the Lean Startup. Anybody here familiar with Lean Startup? Beyond what we said last week? Have you, has anybody started really reading Nail It Then Scale It? Or uh, The Innovator's Method? Okay, Nail It Then Scale It probably is better for this audience than Innovator's Method, but as I said last week, the Innovator's Method is a bit more polished and it's a bit more general. Um, the lean approach says, take your idea and do very agile prototypes of it first. Get it to customers early and often and validate the idea with actual customers before you go spend $3 million trying to develop a product that it's really uncertain whether people will buy. I can't tell you the number of stories I've heard of an inventor had a great idea, they built some product, they now have a garage full of great product that nobody has been willing to buy. Um, that happens over and over and over again. Lean Startup says go to the customers before you go to suppliers and order up the, all the things that you need to order up. Um, okay, so you need to learn about the Lean approach. I'm going to suggest that you go to steveblank.com and look at some of Steve's materials. He is seen as the father of the Lean movement, and uh, he's really, he's, he's great at, at this sort of thing. Um, you need to, there are startup skills you have to learn if you're going to run a company. How do you create a, a venture in the first place? How do you finance it? Or can you bootstrap it? Um, selling, okay, has anybody worked as a salesperson before? That's a lot of hands. Do you like selling? If you're gonna be an entrepreneur, you need to at some level like selling. You have to get excited about your stuff and be able to convince others that this is a cool thing that they ought to be involved in as well. Um, anyway, so there, there are tons of topics that you need to learn if you're gonna be a tech entrepreneur. And so we have some programs here in the Marriott School that will help you with that. How many of you are in the business minor? Okay, that's a good number. We also have majors, we have, um, Oh, and I need to update this because it's now a, a first class major. We have a major in entrepreneurship now. We have an information systems major for those who want to learn the technology side really well. There are a number of graduate programs that are available. And here is a list of some of the, and I'll post these slides after class so that you don't have to write all this stuff down. None of this stuff, you don't have to write any of this stuff down because I will post it all on Learning Suite. Um, but here are some of the classes available. Anybody could take Business Management 170. And if you're wondering, is entrepreneurship really for me? If some of the stories you hear this semester get you excited, then maybe Business Management 170 is a great place for you to go next and say, let me actually learn a little bit more detail about some of the skills I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, what else? And you're in the lecture series now, so that's check on that one. There's also a basic entrepreneurship skills that will take you deeper in. I'd recommend doing 170 first 
And then you can come back and do 372 later if you decide, yeah, I want to actually try building a business while I'm a student here. There are other resources. We have two other centers besides the Rollins Center. There's the Ballard Center for Economic Self-Reliance, and there's the Whitmore Center for Global Management. They have a number of initiatives. We have a great e-club that you could join. Information Systems has the AIS Club, which is wonderful, and there are lots of other clubs. Anybody here a member of Venture Factory? A couple of hands. They've got a great program. If you, if you uh, want to participate in their Student Innovator of the Year, they'll give you $400 to work on a prototype. I have a grant from the National Science Foundation that lets me give student teams one to $3,000 to work on validating their idea, their technology that they want to transfer to the, to the commercial world. Um, we have lots of resources. We do competitions that I, I think I mentioned last week a bit where we give away tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so we, we have resources available that we're trying to seed among the community so that you can feel like you can be successful doing some interesting things that may seem, okay, I hope you listen to the devotional today. Fear not is what President Worthen reminded us of. That's the commandment that he found 78 times in the scriptures. Fear not. If you are afraid to start, you'll just miss opportunities. And some of those are opportunities worth pursuing. So we hope as a center to help you to fear not. We have some great mentors available at the Rollins Center. Dozens of people who would love to help you. And you can, you can go to getmentoring.com or stop by 470 of the Tanner Building to check into our mentoring program. Okay, and many of our mentors are gonna ask you to read stuff. Now, we've already talked about Innovator's Method and Nail It Then Scale It. Steve Blank has a great book called The Startup Owner's Manual that I recommend, and, and here are some other books. There are lots of resources. Come to 470 and visit our library and you can check out, you can at least thumb through and then check out the books that you'd like to check out from that library. And there's more. If you're going to be a tech entrepreneur, you just have to stay on top of things. You have to stay on top of technology, which is always changing. Today, Apple changed the mobile world. Um, you know, has anybody read about the iPhone 10? Do you know what the specs are? What's cool about the iPhone 10? Facial recognition. Um, it's an Organic LED display, now does that matter to you? I don't know if it matters to you. It's gonna be newer and cooler. Uh, anyway, you've gotta stay on top of trends like the stuff that happened today with the Apple announcement. How many have heard of Internet of Things? Do you have a thermostat that's connected to the network? Anybody have a thermostat, a Nest type thermostat that learns your preferences and things like that that you can control from a distance? Has anybody here used a 3D printer? What have you created with your 3D printing? A backpack? Oh, a bagpipe uh, changer? Cha oh, okay. The little, you've actually printed that so you could play a bagpipe. Wow. And did it work? That's cool. 3D printing. There you go. Daniel, what did you do? I made a coin card. Oh. Uh, so, and, and, okay, so now I'm a guy who's 52 years old. What does that mean? Is that some new, uh... oh, I see, okay. So you can keep your coins in your wallet, got it. Okay, coin, it's not some new technology, it's just a, it's a cool idea for organizing your coins. Okay, got it. <laughs> All right, anyway, you can do cool stuff. 3D printing was never a thing until just recently. And there are all kinds of cool opportunities out there if you stay on top of the technology. The lesson from this is either you need to be good at technology or you need to have a good geek as a partner. Okay, which is the cool term? Is it geek or nerd? Who, who says geek is a better term than nerd? Geek? Nerd? Okay, it's kind of split. All right. Anyway. Either be a geek or have a good one as a partner is kind of the lesson that I've seen over the years with technology entrepreneurship. You need to, it's not that you're going to know everything that there is to know out there, but you have to have this mind of saying, I want to continually learn and explore. That's the characteristic you need to develop. And you also need to be really good at business and you need to be really good at interpersonal relationships. 
you're not sitting in a corner all by yourself when you're building a startup. You are out there working with other people and connecting other people. And so it's super important that you be a good networker. I'm not talking about computer networks. I'm talking about people networks. So that's one of the reasons that uh, return missionaries sometimes make good entrepreneurs. They've been out there learning how to connect with people. OK, uh, so the bulk of what I want to talk to you about for the rest of the period is these three fundamental concepts. Network effect, disruptive innovation, exponential technology growth. You'll see these three <coughs> principles repeated time and time again in the tech startups out there. There's a network effect. There are principles of disruptive innovation. And then there's exponential technology growth. Let's start with network effect. A network effect occurs when a product becomes more valuable as more people use it. And I've listed four examples here of products that have experienced a network effect. Telephone network. OK, imagine being Alexander Graham Bell and inventing the first telephone. Did he invent just one telephone, or did he invent two? He invented two because it doesn't do you any good to have just one telephone. I guess if you have one telephone, you can brag about it, and that's about all you can do with it. But once you have two telephones, you can talk to that other point, whether it's close or far. And now another telephone joins the network, and now all of a sudden I've got three telephones in the network. I can call two people, and two other people can each call two people. So if you add that up, where before I had two units of value, I could call one person, <laughs> one person could call me, that's two. Now I've got three phones, and I've got three times two units of value, six. So I went from two to six. When the fourth phone comes in, now I can call three people, and three other people can call three people. I've got 12 <laughs> units of value. Basically, you get exponential growth in the value of the network as more people join the network. So um, I develop a website for my company. If there's only a couple of people on the web, that website isn't very valuable. But if there are billions of people on the web, the value of my site went way up, okay? especially if some of them know how to find me. English language, I've listed that as it's not really a technology per se, but it sort of is. English language is, is um, a very common mechanism for communication with people of all audiences because um, anyway, just a lot of people learn English. Now, other languages could also be, you know, French is a very common one in diplomatic circles and things like that. But as more people learn English, more people want to learn English so that they can communicate with others. Uh, Microsoft Windows held an operating system monopoly. How many of you are running Windows right now? How many of you are running Mac OS? I think it's pretty even between those two. That's a big flip from about 10 or 20 years ago. Um, OK, Robert Metcalf was the founder of 3Com. He's the inventor of Ethernet. And um, he stated this law that we call Metcalf's law that the value of a network increases in proportion to the square of the number of users. So if there are 100 users, 100 squared is, OK, so four zeros, that's 10,000, right? So if I've got 100 users, I'm now up to something on the order of 10,000 units of value in that network. Now if I have 1,000 users, 1,000 squared is a million, six zeros. I'm up to now from 10,000 to a million with a, just a 10x increase. So, so the value of that network grows as the number of users grows. Now, what typically happens to create a network effect is that the initial cost of developing the network is large. But the incremental cost to add a single user is pretty small. Think about what Apple just announced today, the iPhone 10, and the 8 and the 8 Plus. So if you were to compete with the iPhone, what would you have to build to be able to compete with the iPhone? I mean, that's a, that's a huge investment. You have to build hardware. You have to build software, this whole operating system, all the apps that run on that operating system. Um, that's a huge cost. And so there's a huge barrier to us to enter the iPhone market. It's hard for us to compete. And we're not going to go out and do that. Number one, we probably don't have the billions of dollars it would take. And um, anyway. 
It's, it's just, it would cost a lot of money to build that network. What happens when you have a network effect is you get a winner-takes-all cycle. When you have competing technologies, the winner-takes-all because, so let's go to the iPhone here, users like to buy the iPhone because there are lots of developers who write software for the iPhone, plus Apple has made a cool brand and we want to be cool. So there's this style aspect to it as well. Well, developers like to write software for the iPhone because lots of users buy it and there's a huge market. And Steve Jobs did something very brilliant. He taught users how to pay 99 cents for a song, or $1.29, or $1.99, or something like that. How many of you have bought an app on the App Store? Okay, now how many of you have an Android phone? Okay, you Android users, how many of you have bought an app on, on uh, Android's Google Play Store? Okay, that's a much smaller percentage than bought something on Apple's App Store. Has anybody gotten a gift card to the iTunes Store? Has anybody gotten a gift card to Google Play? One, two, yeah, okay. So um, there's a big difference there. Steve Jobs taught his audience how to pay little bits at a time for pieces of, of functionality. Anyway, it's a better marketplace. Developers like being over on the Apple App Store, and users like it, and we have this virtuous cycle that feeds on itself. And we get very close to a winner-takes-all kind of a situation. Now, right now it turns out that, that Android has greater market share than iPhone has, but in the US young adult market, the millennial market, I don't think that's true. I think Apple wins in that market. So, um, now, so network effect, if, if it costs a lot to build something, but it just costs a little bit to add one person, and the value of having more people there increases the value for everybody in the network, that's going to create that winner-takes-all situation. That's principle number one, network effect. Principle number two, principles of disruptive innovation. Anybody know who Clayton Christensen is? Okay, very famous LDS scholar at Harvard. He is great. He wrote this book on, and, and he's the one who in his dissertation work uh, studied disruptive innovation and developed this terminology and taught us about this. A disruptive innovation displaces an entrenched technology. The reason it displaces it is not because it performs better. It's because it provides a better overall value. So what you do when you introduce this innovation, if it's a disruptive innovation, you're altering the basis on which you're competing. Somebody else has been competing in a certain space and you're saying, oh, we're gonna go change the way we think about how to compete. So the way we think about this is a technology trajectory. So take a look at this trajectory, trajectory for a minute. Over time, so this is the, the horizontal dimension is time. Over time, we expect a certain level of performance from a product. And we expect that the product is gonna get better over time. So you see the blue lines going up to the right. Performance, product performance is the vertical dimension here. You have a high end and a low end of the market. So let's talk cars for a second. You and I drive cars. I've been working in my career for 22 years and you're going through college right now. Probably we have a little difference in how we consume motor vehicles, right? Um, when I was your age, I actually uh, got a car as soon as I got married, and um, it, was, it was about 6,800 bucks, something like that, less than $7,000 for a used car. It was a Chevy Nova. It was actually a Toyota Corolla rebranded by Chevrolet as a Nova. It later became the Geo Prism, and then they said, you know what, why are we selling Toyota Corollas? And anyway, they dropped that line. But I bought a Chevy Nova back in, uh, in 1987 for $6,800. It did not have power windows. It did not have power locks. How many of you have bought a first car, used or otherwise? Did it have power windows? How many did not have power windows in that first car? Okay, so a few of you. Um, did it have airbags? Okay, when I was your age, an airbag was a term we used that was very derogatory about a person. Um, uh -huh, okay, um, moving right along. Um, so there's a difference between 1987 and 2017, 30 years later, as to what we expect out of our cars. And uh, we get more sophisticated over time. A remote unlock was just about unheard of when I was a kid. 
Um, so I, li I like cars much better today. They have much better technology. I can sit in my car. And in fact, I don't even have to put a key in the ignition. I just walk up to the thing, I touch the handle, and it, and it unlocks. I sit down, and I push a button, and it starts because I have a key in my pocket. And uh, I drive down the, the road, and if the phone rings, it comes up on the car console, and I can hit a button on the steering wheel and answer the phone. Very different experience than my, when I was younger. Okay, so I'm probably at the higher end of the market over here and certainly well above the expe expectations I had when I was a newlywed. Okay, that's what happens to every technology, is that you start down here, typically you begin at the low end of what the market is looking for. And over time you add features to your product. You get more sophisticated, you learn, you listen to your customers, your best customers are telling you, hey, add X, Y, and Z to, the, uh, to this product and um, it'll be better. And so you do that, and over time, look what happens. Your product actually exceeds the high-end requirement of the market. Now, there, there might be a user here or there who really wants that feature you have, but the average high end of the market is below what your product is capable of. An iPhone 10, does the high end of the market really need all that stuff? Or is Apple just trying to pad its bottom line and say, hey, let's get people excited about new technology because new technology is cool? I don't think the iPhone 10 will get quite the market penetration that the iPhone 8 and 8, 8 Plus will get uh, just because it's, it's kind of expensive. Who wants to pay $1,000 for a cell phone? And that's the basic model, which is pretty cool, but anyway. Um, okay, so. Over time, you get, uh, you, you get a really sophisticated product. Along comes a disruptive innovation, and it begins its own technology trajectory. When the, if, when the disruptive innovation occurs, it lives in the space that's below the low end of the market. It's just somebody's idea. They say, hey, you know, maybe we ought to have a uh, solar-powered black and white television that's five inches. And you look at that and you say, but I expect a 60-inch flat screen 4K television that hangs on the wall and is really cool. So I can watch my football games or whatever else it is that you're interested in. Well, over time, this disruptive innovation progresses. It gets better and better if they stick with it. And when it crosses into the low end of the market, look where the sustaining technology is. It's way above what the high end really needs. Now, that probably means it's expensive. So what you do is you provide a better value. You compete with that super expensive product but because you say, hey, look, I've got this Android phone, and maybe it doesn't have all the bells and whistles of that iPhone, but it's pretty cool. It has a lot of that same stuff, and hey, it's not bad. And uh, look, we satisfy that low-end need at a much more economical rate. And so you've altered the basis for competition. People jump over to this. If you have a network effect in your product, then that'll bring a whole bunch of users, not just one or two, but a whole bunch of them over there. And then you're on your own sustaining technology trajectory. And when you get toward the high end, you better be watching out for the new disruptive innovations as well. OK, so principle number one, network effect. Principle number two. Disruptive innovations can alter the way that you compete. Now, the strategy for dealing with the disruptive innovation, you've, you've always got to be on the lookout for what could possibly disrupt me. And sometimes you have to disrupt your own self. I remember back in the day, Charles Schwab, who had a, a network of stockbrokers, said, we're going to make it easy. We're going to compete with ourselves, basically. We're going to make it easy for people to come to Charles Schwab for electronic trading. Now, have you heard of E-Trade? E-Trade was coming, and Charles Schwab saw that. And because they saw that coming, they were able to create an online uh, stock brokerage, basically, that protected them at some level from E-Trade. They still compete, but, and I don't know how they're doing today, but back in the day, they were able to kind of fend off the early attacks of E-Trade because they were looking ahead and saying, we'll even compete against ourselves. We'll provide online brokerage services, even though that's going to disrupt our people who are working as stockbrokers around the country. Okay, third principle, Moore's Law. Gordon Moore is the co-founder of Intel, and you've probably all used an Intel CPU, and, and um, Intel probably has affected your life directly. 
1965, the year I was born, he made this observation. He said, look, it appears that every two, two years, every 24 months or so, it looks like the number of transistors in our, in our CPUs are doubling. And now, I went to Wikipedia and I pulled up this graph that's fuzzy and hard to read, but go to Wikipedia under Moore's Law and you'll actually see the high-res version of this. This is a log linear line right here. What that means is this, this vertical dimension is, ex is increasing logarithmically. 2,300 to 20,000 to 200,000 to 2 million to 10 million, 100 million, a billion, uh, 2,600 uh, million, 2.6 billion. So this is log linear. So if we were to plot it on a straight up graph, it would be this very steep curve going very straight up there. Um, his prediction has been true my entire life. If you look at it, all those dots represent CPUs that Intel has actually developed. And we have been doubling the number of transistors on our CPUs every two years. Now, what happens when you double every two years? Pretty cool stuff happens. OK, here's a graph that shows that logarithmic progression here. <coughs> There's a story that's told about the emperor of China learning of the game of chess. He loved it and he said, wow, this is a great game. Uh, I think I'll reward the, the inventor of chess with whatever he asks for. And so the inventor of chess goes, hmm, I like just one grain of rice, emperor. And the emperor of China says, just one grain? What are you talking about? Well, one grain for the first square and I'd like two grains for the second square, four grains for the third square, and so forth until we cover the board. Now, so the emperor thinks about it for a minute, and he goes, okay, let's do that. Make it so, number one. That's probably not what he said, but um, had to get my Star Trek reference in there. Um, that's a nerd thing. It's supposed to be funny. Okay, um, could he fulfill that request? How many grains of rice would have to go on the 64th square? Two to the 64th power which is more than the number of atoms in the visible universe. I don't think he could have fulfilled that request. That's what doubling does. So um, now how many years, I'm, I'm 52 years old next month. Okay, so that means divide that by two, that's 26 generations of doubling. So two to the 26th, that is how much transistors on our CPUs have increased in my lifetime. Now, what does that mean in practice? Well, for one thing, it means that I can carry around a smartphone that would run, totally run circles around the PC that I used when I was in college, for one thing. This is way faster than any of the desktop machines I had back in the day. That's pretty cool. It can do voice recognition. I can say, hey Siri, or okay Google, or you know, whatever thing you do, and have it interpret my speech. I can, anyway, it's just, it's, it boggles the mind sometimes to think what power you have here. We have converging trends. It's not just, it's not just that our computers are faster, they can store more. Uh, our bandwidth, our network connectivity is super increased. How many of you have uh, Google Fiber come into your apartment? Do you love it? When it works? Mostly? Okay. That is super fast. Back in the day, oh, sorry, telling one of those stories again. When I was in high school, my friend Boyd, Bubba, we called him, his dad had a modem, and it would run at either 300 bits per second or 1,200 bits per second. It was the kind where you took the telephone and you put it in, you go watch war games and you'll see one of these things. Um, and you put this telephone handset into this cradle and you could talk to the, to the bulletin board system out there. And it boggles my mind how we run circles around that technology now today. You can stream a high definition movie. In fact, you can stream several high definition movies in real time over that same fiber connection coming to your apartment. It is amazing what you can do with the bandwidth. In fact, bandwidth has grown faster than computational power has grown. And this all happens at a decreasing cost per unit and, and connected everywhere like I referred to before. So we have this cascade going on. We increase the speed and capacity of our technology and we lower the cost. So we can process information faster. And now that we can 
process information faster, we rethink things. We have new ideas. We say, hey, you know what, maybe I could take a photo with my smartphone and I could uh, tag people's faces in there and I can upload it to a sh social network and, and share stuff. And anyway, so uh, we develop new goods and services like Instagram. And then we say, hey, you know what, uh, let's build a network effect that's going to increase demand for this. We're going to get people hooked on our technology cocaine or whatever the thing is, you know. We, how many of you would just be unhappy if you lost your phone? Pretty much everybody? <laughs> When's the last time you went without your phone for a day? When's the last time you handed your phone to somebody else and said, I'll see you in six hours? Does that horrify you just a little bit? Are, are we just a little addicted to our, uh, our phones? Anyway, um, we increase demand and that creates a need to invest more money in research and development. And so that leads us to figure out, okay, how do we increase the speed and capacity and lower the cost? And you can better believe it, Intel is spending many, many billions of dollars on this very cycle right here. And so are lots of other companies. Um, it's, it's this virtuous cycle. Now technology has been changing my entire life at this pace, doubling every two years. Business is starting to change just as rapidly as technology has been changing. And so you're all millennials, or is it post-millennial yet? Are you still millennials? Still millennials. Okay, good. Whew. <laughs> okay, I'm not that out of it yet. Okay, here's what I think a millennial needs to be able to do. You've got to go to your first job and you've got to say, how do I add value? How am I going to make a difference to the bottom line of this company? How do I understand the strategic drivers behind my, my company? And so if, if you want to just be a technology guru, that's probably not a solution. You've got to get to where you understand why that makes a difference. And no matter what your job is, you need to know how you fit into the value chain. Where do you make a difference that's going to make that company want to have you around? Again, when I was a kid, I grew up in a generation where my father expected that he could work for one company for almost his entire career. Very few of you will work for one company for your entire career. You've got to be agile, you've got to be diverse, you've got to understand value and how to deliver it. I hope you figure out how to use information technology to solve interesting business problems. I hope you are always thinking about how do I build a competitive edge? How, am I, how can I be creative? and see what's coming out. You're going to have to retool over and over again. So um, I'm teaching a class in how to program iOS devices. And so today's announcement was something that I was paying attention to after the devotional. I went to the devotional and listened. But afterwards, I uh, paid attention to the Apple announcement because it's going to affect my class. And uh, it'll, it'll change the things we do this semester. I have to spend a lot of time staying up to date on technology because that's the world I live in. But you also need to figure out how do I manage my career and yet maintain quality of life? Um, you might even need to invent your own job. Anybody here thinking that they're going to create their own job? A couple of hands. You might discover that a few more of you need to do that than you maybe are expecting. OK, the business environment is evolving rapidly. Here are some trends that I would tell you to watch for. Cloud computing is a big deal these days, and I think virtualization will continue to rise. Internet of Things, 3D printing, those are hot. Social networking continues to be very important. Mobile devices really are a game changer, um, especially apps that are aware of their context, what you're doing as a, as a user. So where you are, wouldn't it be great if your iPhone didn't bug you in the middle of church? Uh, we've, seen some, we've seen some efforts to use little mobile computers and to chain them together. I don't know if that's going to be successful or not. The market will tell. The market will answer that question for us. Now, virtual reality and augmented reality are two new hot things, too. At the announcement today, Craig Federighi showed, hey, here we are mapping the points on my face. And has anybody used Google Hangouts and worn the pirate patch or the, the, you know, the goatee? That's... Kind of, that was a fun thing with Google Hangouts a few years ago. Um, 
So this is in real time a map of a mask being drawn onto his face and uh, um, the phone is powerful enough to do this kind of processing and in really good detail to contour it to his face. So virtual reality, augmented reality are on their way. They're gonna make a difference. Lots of things, keep your eyes out for these. Now here's my call to action and then we'll go. Watch for these principles and trends over the next, over this semester. Um, think about how you can transform, innovate, and build, and I would say to you, get involved and network with each other, with your friends. Figure out how you can use technology to your benefit, and I hope you find this semester inspiring as we bring in different people. Here's my contact information. If anybody wants to chat, come on down. Thank you. Have a great day. We'll see you next week.